Well, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you for allowing me to give my testimony for the very first time to you all tonight. So um, I titled my testimony, God's Plan. The NIV version of the Bible in Psalm 3311 states, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. So I was born and raised as a Catholic believer. I was water baptized. I attended catechism classes, confessionals, and First Holy Communion. However, my family rarely attended church services. It would have been a stretch to say that we were even CNE Catholics, as Dr. Rust would say. Despite not attending routine services, I was always a believer in the Lord, our Savior. However, my idea of the Lord was very obscure. That we'd meet on Judgment Day and answer for the decisions that we had made, but what happened in our lives was totally dependent on us. Fast forward to my high school years. It was my junior year in high school and the night of our homecoming bonfire. After the bonfire was over, I had seen a good friend of mine. We had started to talk. He happened to be there with another guy that I didn't know. So my friend introduced us to one another, and shortly after our introduction, the guy had asked me for my phone number. <laughs> Disinterested to say the least, I replied with not having a pen. And back in those days, not everybody had a cell phone. Persistence at its finest brought this young man back with an eyeliner pencil from another woman to write his phone number on my hand. Of course, I never did call, but a few weeks later, we crossed paths again in the high school hallways. After seeing each other, he again gave me his phone number and told me that I should call him. You might be asking why I'm sharing this story with you, but this was the very beginning of a lifelong journey because that guy's name was John Moyer. No. We had gotten together the day that I called him for lunch, and the, ba and the rest is basically our journey through this thing called life. All of our friends knew just how much we grew in love with one another. It was always Trish and John or John and Trish. We did everything and we went everywhere together. John and I had dated for about two and a half years before finding out that I was pregnant, changing everything. We slowly drifted apart, finding ourselves to be fighting and arguing over just about everything, being dishonest and untrustworthy untrust and disrespectful to one another. The list basically goes on. We eventually went our separate ways when I was about five months pregnant. It was a difficult time for me being that I was just 18 pregnant and now alone. We spent the next two and a half years separated. Co-parenting between us was basically non-existent. During that time, John found himself battling legal situations and traveling through the states. We basically didn't even talk or keep up with one another. Eventually, we both moved on with our lives. I started dating a guy when Matt was about a year old. Things got rather serious between us where I actually thought one day he may be my husband. Close to two years later, out of nowhere, I got a collect telephone call from a local jail. John was on the other end. He basically called to let me know while in jail he had a dream where he and I were gonna get married. I laughed, told him it was never gonna happen, and then we hung up. A few months later, he showed up at my parents' house. Me and the guy I had been dating actually were no longer together, and much to my disbelief, I found our family back together again. Our relationship seemed to be perfect again. We eventually moved in with one another, and after another few years, we were married. Shortly after our wedding, we had in our hearts that we wanted to live in Florida. The idea was thrown back and forth about moving several times after we had visited a city in southern Florida a few years back. After careful discussion, we decided against making the big move. Mostly the idea of not having a job or a place to stay scared us enough to stay. It just wasn't the right time. So we ended up buying our first home together in Pennsylvania. Once we were settled, we had to talk about a second baby. I'd always wanted at least two children, and in my mind thought that we were doing things the right way this time. We were married, we had a brand new home, and two good jobs for support. I found myself pregnant again very shortly after having that baby conversation. After giving birth to our second boy, our relationship basically fell apart again at the seams. We found ourselves being mixed up into daily drug use, alcohol, sexual sin, being dishonest, unloving, disrespectful, 
and disloyal to one another all over again. We even tried to separate for a short time, but found it almost impossible. We stayed together, but it never seemed the same. Good news, there was a turning point. Bad news is it always gets worse before it gets better. So one night, we were with one of our friends at our house and somehow got into a conversation about the Ouija board. I was extremely naive to the spiritual realm at that point and even remember making a comment that those things do not even work. I was so certain that they didn't work that I convinced them to play the game with me. We didn't own a board, so we went to the local Walmart and Target looking for a board. But, of course, they didn't sell one, and I didn't let that stop me. We went back to the house, and I made my own. Making a long story short, they do work. After several times playing on that homemade board, the demonic things that started happening around us were certainly undeniable. Our friend had even totaled her car on the way home that night. After this experience is when we both realized that something had to give. Our actions and behaviors were no longer even suitable for living. John called upon the only man that he knew to help us, Dr. Russ. He told us about a church that he had just started pastoring in Pensacola, Florida. That our call was perfect timing because they would be doing a week-long deliverance meeting at the end of that month that we could attend. Knowing the gathering about the gathering was one thing, but getting, into, getting to it was another. I didn't have enough time in advance to request off from work, so I needed to submit a letter to the administration team explaining why I needed unexpected time off. But you may have guessed, they denied my request. We most certainly made that trip, though. The Lord made a way for me to still get time off from work and the means to make it happen. For some of you here at the dwelling place, that was the first time we had met. John and I spent the week, went through several corporate and individual deliverance sessions, and Freedom Ministry is the real deal. I was delivered from drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, and even physical problems. I also learned that forgiveness, or lack thereof, majorly impacted my life. We had left Pensacola with freedom that I never knew existed, but the best part of it was he had saved our marriage. We left with a brand new mindset, we were sober and goal-oriented. For the next eight months, we did really well at attending church every Sunday, got involved into small groups, and held each other accountable for the things that we said and did. But whether it be the environment we were in or on our own will, we found ourselves turning back to the drug and partying world. John and I discussed again the possibility of moving somewhere else. One night, he had a dream. Basically, we were at our house, and we were with a bunch of people that were all over our house. He found me sitting on the front porch and had asked me why we didn't leave for Florida. I replied, we decided not to go. You see, the dream was a representation of what our lives would have been like if we had never left. It would have been exactly the same as before. So we immediately made sure that we had plans that we were not stuck in that place forever. We had planned our financial situation the best that we could. When it was all planned out, we didn't even have enough money for the U-Haul. In case you guys don't know, but a U-Haul for such a big trip was over $1,500. When I went to pick up my last paycheck, there was just enough extra money for that moving truck. The Lord knew the money would be there for us if we didn't have it until the last minute. It was absolutely incredible to see God working on our behalf through this entire journey. We literally left our home unsold, had no idea where we were going, and no job to rely on when we got there. Basically, we faced the same hurdles as last time, except this time it was different. We didn't let any of those stop us. It may have basically told us when we pulled into her driveway with U-Haul that she had found us a nice place to rent. <laughs> Later, we actually found out that the place that we were renting, the landlord attempted to sell that place, and she wasn't able to sell it. She, wanted, she had to rent that to us. The best part is she agreed to let us rent the place without even meeting us. Now, a year later, our landlord told us she planned to sell again. With bad credit and nowhere to go, the Lord opened another door of opportunity for me and my family. We found this beautiful house online listed as a rent-owned property. The owner actually lives in southern Florida, and another person again agreed to have us move in, rent the home with an option to buy at the end of the agreement without having met us. God is good. Amen. There's a saying that you may have to give back everything the devil has given to you. You see, we had every materialistic thing a man could desire. 
We had accomplished more things than some people ever do in a lifetime before the age of 30. We had a brand new house, brand new cars, boats, motorcycles, you name it, we had it. Our lives were picture perfect on the outside and a complete wreck on the inside. But God has his hands in everything. So I encourage you to welcome life's trials and tribulations. It is his timing and his plan. In the words of Pastor Maeve, trials are sent to us, for us. I will wrap up with looking at two different Bible verses regarding life's trials. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right, next we got Daniel Parsons. Fantastic. That was awesome. Um, sorry, I got to pull up my notes because I had it the wrong screen. I was, when I found out I was going to speak, it was probably about two weeks ago, and I was like, all right, Lord, what do I want? What am I going to talk about? Like, you know, there's so much going on in my head. There's just, I read like eight books at a time. And so I, there's always random stuff going on in my head. And I was like, oh, the, the veil. And I was like, all right, cool. What am I, all right. And the next day I was like, you know, all right, cool. You know, where am I going with it? And he's like, oh, I'm talking about the veil. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And so he finally like started explaining where, where he was going with it. Um, and I made some little notes here to little half sheets someone wants to pass these out somebody wouldn't mind just because it's a lot of verses and just kind of some bullet points um any time that the father gives revelation it's always an invitation for us to go deeper and i kind of want to just take you on a journey of this, just the revelation on the veil and just the temple that the Lord's been taking me on for over four years. Um, it started, I guess it started when I heard somebody talking about like um, just the different like rooms of heaven, the different things of heaven, and it just kind of grew from there. And I just kind of want to tell you, take you biblically where I was going and what the Lord showed and then kind of kind of show where I've been. And hopefully it's something that will be a springboard or a catalyst for some of you. Um, so starting, let's see if I can get this going right. I'm going to start with Ezekiel 28, um, verse 12. It says, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is said to Satan, by the way. Um, this is a very weird way to start off, but please just follow me. You, Satan, were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. Stop right, right there really quick. Um, if you re compare that with... Didn't put it in the notes. Oh, Exodus 28. It talks about the high priest. And everything that the high priest had, it was a breastplate of gold. It was these stones. And there's nine stones said here that Satan had. And seven of the nine are the exact ones that God told Moses, hey, put these on the breastplate of the priest because what's going to happen is you're going to be before me and I'm going to have a nation of kings and priests. And because of that, we're just going to slap Satan in the face. So verse 14, you, again, Satan, were anointed as a guardian cherub or cherubim, for so I ordained you. You are on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You are blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. 
Your heart became proud and on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth. Uh, where was I? I threw you to earth, and I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins, a dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you. It consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. That may be a really weird way to start out. I'm sure it's just kind of like, you know, Daniel, where the, where the heck are you going? Um, but do you know about what the law of first mention is? Anyone? A few of us. Awesome. Um, Hebrew hermeneutics, one of the, there's four main points. One of them is the law of first mention, which is anytime you hear something mentioned in the Bible, you go back to the first time it's mentioned to see kind of put it in context. And so he's talking about Satan in the Garden of Eden, and he, he was a cherubim. So you go back, all right, where's the, the first mention of cherubim? God makes us, God makes man in the likeness in his image, man falls. And then Genesis 3, 24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Um, <laughs> And so you have the cherubim that were placed at the Garden of Eden because the cherub that was in heaven was kicked out. And so now you have these high priests that are kept out of Eden by the cherubim. Are, is everybody following? Awesome. One person is. So, <laughs> um, so Ian Clayton said, Basic Hebrew culture believed that everything that is associated with the Father's kingdom on earth is a shadow and an image of a reality that is in heaven. Basically, when we begin to mature into who we are supposed to be called to in Christ, we become the, who we are in heaven onto earth, so that what is in heaven will be manifest on earth. And so if everything that is associated with the kingdom on earth is a shadow of heaven, we're going to, let, let's just go, to, go back to the veil and the temple really quick. Exodus 26, and you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. Because this pattern was shown from the heavenly pattern, Moses, make sure you do this as you were shown on the mountain. Verse 31, sorry, I forgot to pull the verses over here. Verse 31, make a curtain of blue, talking about the veil, separating the... Um, holy place, holy of holies, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasp and place the Ark of the Covenant law behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant law in the most holy place. So, Glad it's still showing up. That's just kind of a quick little view of it. Most of us, most of us have seen some sort of diagram of the temple. Um, I don't have a pointer, but go back to where number three is. That's where the veil is. So the veil has on it cherubim. God said, put cherubim on the veil. So we are a nation of kings and priests, right? Awesome. If we are a nation of kings and priests, said three times in the Bible, Exodus, I think 1 Peter and Revelation, we are to operate as priests. A priest would go through the veil once a year, offer the sin um, atonement, and um, he would put the blood of the sacrifice on, on the mercy seat, the glory cloud would appear, all this amazing stuff. Um, there's, all I got to do is look, look it up. It says it everywhere where it was. It's really awesome. Um, the thing is, there were only certain people that could actually go into the veil, go to the most holy place. Those were the priests of the line of Aaron, correct? correct. All right. I'll get y'all talking sooner or later. So, Jesus comes along. They've been doing the sacrifice, doing all this for, you know, since it was started back in Exodus. Jesus comes along. Who is the high priest? Who was the high priest when Jesus was sacrificed? Awesome. <laughs> what 
what happened is Caiaphas and, um, was it Annas? Was that the name? How do you pronounce it? And, and I was, it depends on the version. That, that's why I was like, it's weird. I, anyways, sorry, side note. Um, Ananias, Caiaphas, what happened is they bought their way into being the high priest. Big no-no. I wouldn't recommend it. So when Jesus is sacrificed as the lamb, the high priest is not who the high priest was supposed to be biblically the way the Lord intended it. So who was supposed to be the high priest when Jesus was alive? Anyone? Bingo! If you're wondering where that comes from, just really quick over here in Luke. Luke 1, 5, in the days of Herod the Great, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. It's as though Luke was telling us, hey, father and mother were both the line of Aaron. Hint, hint. Luke 1.8. I don't have it up here. Luke 1.8. Now it happened while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, while serving as priest before God in the order, appointed order of his priestly division, as was the custom of the priesthood. He was supposed to be priest, in case you missed that. So John the Baptist was supposed to be the high priest. He's out baptizing people. If I'm a priest and I'm going to baptize someone into being the next priest, I'm going to baptize Michael, he's going to be the next priest, I, will, I would, it's called a mikvah, I pronounce it very poorly, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. What I would do is I would baptize, fully immerse, and then when he comes up, he would be, it would be me saying, hey, my authority is a priest, I'm putting on him to become one. So then we come over to Matthew when... Um, when Jesus comes up, we all know the story. Jesus is like, yo, dude, you got to baptize me. John's like, nah, bro, you got to baptize me. Jesus is like, no, it's got to be done this way. And John's like, you know what? Cool. All right. John baptizes Jesus. The heavens open. Dove descends. That's my version. <laughs> In case anyone was wondering, don't, book, don't go looking for that one in the NIV. So... <laughs> So what we have is the high priest, John. Clearly, Luke is saying, John's a high priest, John's a high priest, John's a high priest. You know who the high priest is? <laughs> John. John the high priest baptizes Jesus. So when John dies, that's the end of the line of Aaron, of the high priest. So Jesus, who is our great high priest, he begins the priesthood, a new higher covenant, a new higher level of priesthood in the order of Melchizedek is said in Psalm 110.4. David prophesies, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Right there, which I did slowly. So now we have, we have the, the temple, which has the cherubim, all this. The priest was supposed to go through into the holy place offer everything, offer the sacrifice, and then come out once a year, right? That's right there. You have, Jesus, you have John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Jesus begins the priesthood, right? right? Awesome. Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. When he is slain, in Matthew, I forget, the, I think Matthew 27, it says, Jesus dies, he cries out with a loud voice, earth shakes, Tombs are open, all this crazy stuff. But the one we're talking about is, it says very specifically, the veil was torn from top to bottom. So just kind of picture yourself being the priest that's in there at the time, who's, you know, cleaning stuff, putting the bread out, and then all of a sudden you just hear that, and you're like, I'm about to die. I can't see what's on the other side of that. I'm about to die. So Jesus tears the veil. What was on the veil? Awesome. Cherubim, in case you forgot that part. So we have the high priest. He tore the veil. The cherubim who were guarding Eden, remember the law of first mention. So we have the cherubim on the veil protecting the holy, play, the holy of holies. You have the cherubim protecting Eden, which had the garden of the tree of life. What happens is the, t the veil tears, and when the veil was torn, Eden was reopened. Um, and 
it says multiple times in Hebrews, multiple times throughout the Bible, that the, on, the way to have a remission of sins is by sacrifice, by the blood. When Satan, fell, fell, when Satan sinned, fell from heaven, the heavenly temple had to be cleansed. If you want proof of that, I'm about to jump into Hebrews, a whole, di- whole few different verses, follow with me, I'm going somewhere. We have Hebrews 6, 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, and the curtain had on it? Sure. Sure. Awesome. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 8, 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Is everybody following me here? Yes. Just kind of look, look at this again. High priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. And I'll remind you what he said to Moses. They serve at a sanctuary that's a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So where was he shown this pattern? Where did it come from? It came from the father who's talking to the father face to face. The father was saying, this is the pattern which is in heaven right now, the heavenly temple. Make it this way. Because if you don't make it this way, later on when Samuel prays and, he, and all this, the glory will not be able to fall because what you have made is an image of the earthly and not an image of the heavenly tabernacle. So if you are made in the image of the heavenly, I can fill it with my glory. If you are made in the image of the earthly, it will be filled with the soulish prayers. Uh, Hebrews 8, 6, continuing on. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, the, high, the priest at the time, as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Let me uh, make sure I'm in the right area. There we go. Hebrews 9, 11. In case you're wondering, just start reading Hebrews 5 or 6-ish and just keep reading. He just keeps saying this over and over and over about the high priest and how Jesus is the high priest. And it's amazing because it's not like they can make copies, but the person that wrote the book of Hebrews wrote this all out by hand, very much like, hey, let's put this in as many ways as possible. So later on, when someone like Daniel, who just starts reading and loses track of focus, and then three verses later starts paying attention again, he's like, oh, back to this point. And then he loses focus and he comes back and he's like, oh, the same point. Because what happens is if, we don't, if you don't actually see what the Bible is saying, we'll always live off of what we're told by man instead of what the Lord is saying in the Bible. <laughs> Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So, clearly the Lord is saying there is a temple in heaven. There is a heavenly tabernacle that is made, and what Moses made was made in the image of what God was saying. 
when God even ordained the priest, he said, hey, make the breastplate like this because what was in heaven before the creation of the world that was fallen, I'm going to start making priests and a nation of kings and priests who are going to carry what was originally in heaven. I'm going to put it on them, put it over them to where when, wherever they go, they will show this is my people. Like it literally says in gold with these stones. What happened is when they would go into the Holy of Holies, it was all gold in there and gold is the greatest conductor of electricity. So when they would start doing the, start chanting and start doing the, the motions and things, the frequency of heaven would come and that was basically the beginning of electricity, just to, you know, picture it that way. <laughs> and so what happened is because they didn't go in with a light. Have you ever thought about that? There was no light in the Holy of Holies and when they would go in, it, there's no light. And so if you're not careful, you kick something and then all of a sudden your blood's flowing because you stubbed your toe. What happened is the Lord came and there was the light of the glory of the father. Because if you go back to the temple, he talks to Moses and Moses has to wear a veil because it was showing so brightly. And so you have all this going on and what, and whenever it would be, the ark would be glowing Everything that they had on them, the gold, the stones, would just be radiating, just different. It would be like me holding a light right here and having just 12 diamonds, and you just see everything radiating. That's because what the priests in the Old Testament carried, the Lord would shine on them, and they would reflect the Father in the many facets of the Father. And now we are a nation of kings and priests, and we are called to radiate. Since we are a temple of the Lord, we are called to radiate and do that Do that of ourselves. But if we are a temple of the Lord, then everything that the temple symbolized, we are called to be. For example, you have the altar of sacrifice in, uh, in the old covenant, new covenant, we're called to be a living sacrifice. Old covenant, table of showbread of the presence of the Lord, new covenant, we are carriers of the presence. Old covenant, you have the golden lampstand, new covenant, Jesus himself, you're the light of the world. Let your light shine before God, this little light of mine. All these things that if, you be, if we begin to realize that we are a temple of the Lord, we are begin, we're going, going to begin to show that. And the temple had the angels, which was a, uh, there was angels on the curtain. And since we are the temple, we have angels around us. And I'd, I would love to just begin to talk about the temple and everything the Lord's told me, but I mean, we'd be here till probably next week and I don't think I would ever be allowed to speak again. I don't think anyone would stay around. <laughs> but we have an invitation to visit the temple and to go into the heavenly realms. And religion would say, I will wait until I die to go visit. You know, I'll, when I get to heaven, the sweet by and by, but the Lord's saying, no, you can come up here even now. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And it would be very easy to listen to the enemy say even now, well, Daniel, you know, you're prophetic. You see things. Your name is Daniel Joseph. They were both seers, dreamers. You can see things. That's for you. You can see it. I'll wait until I go to heaven. But if you allow that to happen, you will always keep that part of heaven from manifesting on the earth. And I just kind of want to give a little bit of a story of when I went, not to say, look at what I've done, but to say, if I can do it, anyone can. Like literally, if I can do it, anyone can. But I don't want to say how I went because it's very easy for me to hear somebody say, this is how I had an experience with the Lord. And I expect that experience the same way without without seeking the Lord of, the, of what happened and saying, Lord, if you can do it for them, you can do it for me. Right. And there's a lot of focus nowadays on, the, I don't want to sound mean in saying this, on like the throne room, on the courts of heaven, and on two or three aspects. Don't get me wrong, those are phenomenal. Throne room prayer, phenomenal. Courts of heaven, phenomenal. All of these things, I'm not belittling them at all. But if we only relegate our experience and our 
manifesting heaven on earth to a few aspects of heaven will never be able to fully manifest and Lord will have to wait for the next generation to come along who are hungry enough that they want to manifest everything that heaven has. And I feel like even now the, the Lord's saying, you know, come up here, come up and explore all of heaven because when you encounter more of what heaven is offering, you learn how to bring heaven onto the earth. Yeah. Um, my job is I do real estate photography, which means I go into areas of people's houses that if I were to visit, I wouldn't normally go to. I'm not gonna just walk into the master bathroom. I'm not gonna walk into the master bedroom. But because that's what I've been called by the Lord to do, I'm able to go into different areas, but oftentimes what we do is we say, you know, oh Lord, we can do this. And he says, all right, come up here. And so we go to this one aspect of heaven and that's where we stop. But he's saying, there's so much more. Like, do you realize what heaven is? And um, the Lord asked me November 17, 2015. Um, I keep this journal on me and not just because it's beautiful and has a Georgia G on it. <laughs> Amen. Um, but I keep it on me because I'll write down, I'll write down so many things that I can go back and years later I can see it and be like, oh, I totally forgot about that. Uh, November 17, 2015, the Lord said, will you come to the intercession room of heaven with me? Many want to visit heaven, but few will ever want to find it. This room, the intercession room, is large enough to hold many, but few have ever seen or wanted to see it. Many want to see me as king, which I am, but few long to see me as the great intercessor, which I am. And it's times like that that I'm like, all right, Lord, what, if you're asking me this, it's because you're demanding an answer. And not in a mean way demanding, but it's, he's saying, if you want this, it's yours, but if you don't want it, I'll find somebody that wants it. And August 2, 2015, the Lord said, I reopened Eden when I tore the veil. He said that to me, and I, it, it's been going through my head for the last four years. And when I first heard about the Heavenly Temple, I was like, awesome, you know, I want to go, I want to experience it, you know, all this. And so I remember saying, like, Lord, can I go to heaven? Can I visit this? And he said very sternly, no, you must first learn the way in. He did, didn't do this because he's cruel. He did it for me to seek him out. Because if I seek the door that the Lord wants me to go through, that door will always be open to me. If I seek out the door of revelation, then that door of revelation will always be accessible by me. Because if he had just made it happen, it would have been an experience that I can never duplicate. But because I said, all right, Lord, how do I get there? He has opened that door, and now I can go in and out whenever I want. And I, like I said, I don't say this to be prideful. I don't say this to say, you know, oh, look at me. I say this because it's available to everyone. And the enemy has very easily convinced a lot of people, even in the charismatic prophetic church, that, well, that's not my gifting. I'm not, I'm not a prophet. I'm not this. But the Lord's like, dude, I made you to carry heaven. Therefore, you got to know what you're carrying. And so the Lord, when he did finally allow me to enter, um, I just want to kind of tell you what I saw just to try and create a hunger and to try and just stir up something. Because even if it's just one person that's like, I can do this because I am a priest. I am seated with God in heavenly places. That's not just a verse. That's a lifestyle. Then we are called to be seated with him in the heavenly places. And the Lord will only give us keys to the door that our maturity will allow us to steward and honor. Uh, when the Lord allowed me to enter, he, it opened up a doorway into the heavenly realm that I can now go in and out of. Um, Revelation 1 says, I heard, I heard, and I turned. He stewarded that, and so Revelation 4, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. If that's a lot of us, we have the, the, I heard and I turned, but we don't steward it long enough to hear the Lord say, now come up here. Where is it? I was in prayer. This was 2015, 2016, I believe. 
And I, just, I remember seeing, I had my eyes closed and it was just very clear all of a sudden I saw the veil was opened and the Lord told me to step into the Holy of Holies and it's like, no. I know what happens when you go in there. And I was like, okay, here it goes. And when I stepped in, it was just very clear and everything around me, it was very, it was, everything was golden. Except for when I looked, I saw the, um, the tab the not tabernacle, the mercy seat, and there was blood on the mercy seat, and that was the only thing in there that was not the purest gold you could imagine. And on the walls there was writing, and it was the writing was literally coming alive. It was say like Lion of Judah, Great I Am, the Yod Hey Vav Hey, the Rose of Sharon, all of these things, and it wasn't all in English, but I knew that it was the many languages and many tongues that were all worshiping the Lord, and it was just it was literally coming alive. It's the only way to explain it. And I was like, whoa. Whenever we bring my cat to the vet, we open the door and he's always like, <laughs> and that's how I was. It's like one step at a time. And so what happens, I, I turn around from the wall and I saw where the veil would be. And it was just a wall of angels. At that point, I was like, oh, the cherubim. <laughs> Should have seen that a long time ago. But they weren't just standing there. They were looking towards me. And I was like, you, you feel kind of self-conscious. And what happens is, what happened is I was like, uh, okay. And so I think it was the next time I went, it, I found it easier to be able to go in because I was using the door that the Lord gave me. And so the next time I went, I saw the veil and, and the Lord was like, no, step out. And I was like, no. And so I stepped from the Holy of Holies into the most holy place through the veil. And it was, a, it was just a change. It was a very tangible change in the atmosphere. I was the only one in the room. I don't know what happened if somebody else would have been in the room. But I'm literally walking in the physical and knowing I'm there in the spiritual. And I remember, and I was like, okay. And so I'm looking around, there's... Everything I've imagined of the temple was there, and it was all golden and just beautiful. And so I look at the, where the angels were, and it's this wall of angels still looking in, but they can't see in. And it was just this dark cloud. And throughout the Old Testament, it talks about the dark cloud of his glory. And they were looking in, but they couldn't see in. And then there was a longing in me. I was like, I've got to get back in there. And so I went back through the veil, and I was like, I've got to go back in. And so I got to it, and I was like, uh, and the Lord... Were, Lord just very calmly was like, boldly enter through the throne of grace. And at that point, there was just a peace, and I just, I was able to step back in, and there was an instant atmosphere change. And I was like, oh, this is so good. And I was like, you know, Lord, can I tell anyone? Like, what do I do with this? And he basically said, don't talk, basically don't talk about it until you've got a handle on it. And I'm like, okay. And so I don't even think I have a handle on it now, but it's because I didn't want to speak something in immaturity and call someone else to stumble because I wanted to brag about something the Lord was doing instead of waiting until I matured and actually understood some of what the Lord was doing. Um, and so a few, I think it was two years later, after all of this, I was going through some things just personally and I was having a rough week and I, I just remember going to the prayer room and I just remember praying and I was like, God, you are good. And I, I'm declaring this over myself. I was like, God, I believe you're good. God, I know you are good. And it was at that moment that the Lord just, he, it was like all of a sudden he said, boom. And I, I was in the Holy of Holies again. I was like, oh, this is it. And everything that was going on personally just began to just fall off. Just like, that's all earthly stuff. Don't worry about that. And when I got there, it was the only time I've seen anyone else in the Holy of Holies, and it was Jesus himself, and he was waiting with his arms open. And I just went into him, and he hugged me, and he said to me very gently, I told you that this is the place of true intercession. So why do I say all of this? Why do I, why do I start talking with Satan and end with Jesus in heaven? It's because I want to begin to try and whet your appetite, begin to give something that makes you say, Lord, if you can do it for them, you can do it for me. What, what happened in the Bible, if you see Ezekiel and getting pulled, grabbed by the hair of his head, 
it's not a story. It's the Lord saying, if I can do it, then I can do it now. When you see all of these things in the Bible, it's not because the Lord was just bored and wanted to write some stories. It's because he was saying, this is just the start of something new. And if you remember that everything associated with the Father's kingdom on earth is a shadow of what is in heaven, then we need to, understand, we need to begin to learn how to go into heaven and see who we are in heaven before we ever begin to live that out on the earth. And I don't really know, ever since I made all these notes, I was like, Lord, how am I going to end this? Like, I don't really know. Like, it's, I don't really know what to say. It's just kind of a not great way to end things is, and here we go, and drop the mic. But the but Lord said to me that, you know, every journey with him, it starts with revelation. And oftentimes we stop at revelation but starts with revelation and it continues with desire because we often read the verse that says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and he will give you the desires of your heart. But we, what we don't realize is if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, that will be your desire and he will give you those desires of your heart. And so what starts with revelation, it continues with desire and it increases with sacrifice because oftentimes I've been told multiple times by the Lord, like, no, you can't go there. You're too fat. And I've got to sacrifice something and shed something off. And when you get to that point of living the priestly life of the start with the revelation and then continue with that desire of like, Lord, I want this. I've got to have this. You said I could have it. I've got to have it. And he says, all right, well, you got to let go of this. And then there's sacrifice. Once we finally get past that sacrifice, he says, here's the door. And it's an open door that's forever open to us. And he says, here's the keys to the door. Steward it well. Because you don't give keys to somebody that won't steward it. If I have a mansion, I'm not going to give the keys to just some kid that just graduated high school. I'm going to find somebody that will steward it and will take care of it. And that's what the Lord is looking for even now, I believe, is he's looking for the people that will steward what he's doing and that will take revelation and go from revelation and use that as a springboard, not use that as an ending point. All right. Wow. I was a lot I'm like looking around. Y'all have the same face I do. So I'm, I'm glad we're here in the same boat. Um, I'm going to bring these two guys up here as our fashion is um, to pray and to because, you know, when you, it's your testimony, I truly believe you hold those keys. And so if there's somebody in here who you need, you have a family member or you yourself need some things redeemed. Trish and John are going to pray for you because that was an absolutely awesome um, testimony. And what I love the most about it is, is she showed you the up and down. She showed you that, you know, and it's so real because so many of us step out and we're like, yeah, we're gung ho. And then life comes or we get around other Christians and people who didn't believe exactly how we believed. And so we compromise on some things the Lord told us because we don't necessarily see the way. And then all of a sudden we're back doing things that we don't realize how we even got there. But the next time the Lord shows us a spot to jump out, to launch out, gives us a dream or a vision that's like, this is what is going to be. If you don't, this is your time. This is your time frame. This is your opportunity. Then they stepped forward. And I loved it because their story is a lot like mine as far as didn't have any idea. God said go. And they were like, you know what? This time we're going. And uh, it was absolutely awesome. And it's a way, if you're in a transition, if you're also in a place of where you don't know what, I want them to pray for you. Because at the end of the day, they hold a key. That God gave them a dream and gave them a vision and they stepped out on it and they took it. So if you're afraid to take that step, if you're in a transition or you need redemption for you or one of your family members, we're going to let John and Trish pray for you. Um, with Daniel, Daniel said a lot of things um, and it was absolutely awesome. And I think, you know, it, it's one of those things when someone speaks from a place of understanding with things that you haven't even thought about before. Sometimes you can be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was on your last point. 
Like, can you hang on a minute? Let me like grasp this so I can get to where you are right here. But the thing that I loved that Daniel said was, is he was trying to birth a hunger. And again, that resonated with my spirit because I've been reading through the glory books and it was regular that people would see visions of Jesus. Like it wasn't just like a, oh, this person was spiritual enough to see his face or to see his hands or to go to heaven. It was in their services regularly. Kids, children, people would see Jesus. Until I really started reading these books, I never had an understanding. You can see the face of God. Because, you know, in Moses, he couldn't. Turn, you can't see my face. But I'm part of a new covenant. And he's the high priest. He's standing before me. He died for me. He wants me to see his face. But if I never have an understanding of it can be mine, I can have it, then I'm never going to seek it because it's like it's too outside. So I love what Daniel said is if he did it for me, he can do it for you. And what I'm telling you is God is just looking for a hungry people. And I truly do believe that. He's looking for people who are hungry enough to say, like Daniel said, I want to take you somewhere, but are you willing to take off something? Are you willing to lay down? Are you willing to sacrifice? Because I promise you, if you, if you study what Daniel's talking about, the priesthood, the, the high priest wasn't just like, oh, it's my title. So now it's my day. I'm going in. No, 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 no. They had a ritual that they had to do. And it involved getting completely stripped down, washing down, cleansing themselves inside and out so that they could walk into that place and putting on something pure. And I truly do believe that that's where we are. And I truly do believe after the words that have been coming that that's what God has for us. And that this is a now word for exactly what he's wanting to do because we pray for the glory to come and we pray for the cloud and we've had words saying it's coming and it's close and God's going to do these amazing things. But what I'm telling you is, is when he comes and you're not ready, you're going to find yourself in a very precarious situation. And I, and, and he is looking for people who are hungry enough to set aside agendas to set aside schedules, to set aside what you think church should look like, what you want the pastor to say to you, who shook your hand that morning. He's wanting us to lay all of that aside and get to a place where it's only him. I just want you. And when we get to that place, he's going to take us to his home because he loves us, right? He wants us to be with him, but I've got to want to be with him more than I want to do other things or the more than I want other things. Um, so I'm going to have Daniel come up here if, if, um, to pray. If you, you want a hunger, he's prophetic. He'll probably prophesy over you. Um, but if you want a hunger, if you're longing to see something in your life that's just not mundane, Christianity for the last hundred years has not been the book of Acts. And it has not been what God intended it to be. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just saying that there's a hunger stirring in the earth and God's beginning to reveal things. And what he said is true. It starts with a hunger for the word because that is where the wisdom and revelation comes from. And unless you're in the word and unless you're diving in and you crave it, it's really got to be the bread of life. It's really got to be what we want because that's where he's going to reveal those things. And then that's where he's going to take you to the next place. And that's where he's going to begin to show you the next things. So you want dreams, visions. If you want to step into the holy of holies, if you want to see Jesus face, because I believe it's an now word and I believe that's what he's doing in the hearts of his people. Um, we're going to let Daniel pray. If you have that redemption story, if you uh, want, if there's anybody in your family life or whatever that needs that redemption story and that needs to be prayed, we're going to have uh, John and Trish as well as if dreams and visions in transition to go forward, what you should do next, da, 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 because they've lived it. And when you've lived it, you have the key to it. So I'm going to bring them two up. I'm going to let Christina throw on some uh, music back there. And um, we're just going to enter a time of prayer. And, and this is just what I want to say. Somebody, and I'm forgetting who it is, said you can have as much of God as you want. But it doesn't mean you're going to take everything with you that you had. So, with that in mind, and with Daniel's story, and with the testimony that came forth tonight, I do believe we're at a shifting point. If you want anything of God, I believe you can have it tonight. 
Um, so we're going to let you step out, you know, get in a mode of prayer, get whatever, whatever it is that you want. You know, if you come before the Lord with something specific, he's going to give you something specific. So that's what I'm believing. Christina's got the music playing. Come forth if you want prayer. And we're just going to stay here. If you need to leave, feel free to leave. Again, we've got Dr. Russ um, this weekend, uh, Sunday morning. And we've got throne room prayer Friday night at House of Prayer for All Nations.